cells, but there's a big role of cells even for managing or treating any kind of disease, including diabetes as well. So the number of drugs with passage of time has been increasing. I think you all are very much aware. Uh, since earlier days, we have been having sulfonyl ureas and insulin. Although in the recent times, newer medicines has been coming up, like the metformin, the meglutinides, or even the incretin mimetics as well, or DPP force. So what happens is there are lot of limitations as well. Limitations in the sense it tends to depend quite a lot upon the renal function. So for example, if someone's renal function is good, yes, then you can use a lot of those medicines. However, when you are trying to think if someone's renal function test is limited, then the choices which is available for you is very, very less. So for example, if someone is having severe renal dysfunction, so you are left out with medicines like insulin, otherwise DPP-4 inhibitors. This is a slide which contains all these drugs. So what are those brands which is available? What is their mechanism of action? The adverse effects and the precautions. But we will try to focus today on the DPP-4 inhibitors. So one of the important names which comes for this is Exendin-4. So this, there is a uh, Gila monster which is mostly commonly seen in the Mexico. So what was observed was this monster tends to eat only four times a year. And then what happens is it can not only shut down the pancreas but also it has a special enzyme in its saliva which is Exendin-4. So that is what was tried for the humans as well. And then they have been observing that yes, it seems to be very uh, pretty good as well. And some of the other important components, especially for the treatment of these diabetic patients as well, we need to understand is not only we have to give medicine, but also we have to treat the, uh, the educate the patients, trying to monitor uh, or tell them what are the various signs and symptoms for the pancreatitis. So what else are you aware of this drug? Can you think of any other examples of the DPV-4? So what are the various examples for that? So the various examples are, it can be including two ways. One is whenever you are trying to give any medicine, you, you can think of, is it similar to the insulin? That is the first. Second thing is, otherwise you have to antagonize the action of the GLP-1 receptors. So yes, GLP receptor agonists, they can have complementary actions as well. And they can also have additive action as well. This is one of the reasons why basal insulin is combined with GLP. Hey, hey, hey. Hello, uh, so this is what is being done. And then other than that, what happens is, so there are some adverse effects and warnings as well uh, with this. So you are not supposed to be using this for patients, for example, who is having a personal or even family history of medullary thyroid carcinoma and also if there is any history of multiple endocrine neoplasia so what is like which is called as MEN2 so so what happens is GLP-1 has got plenty of actions in different organs different organs include the liver brain heart pancreas skeletal muscle the blood vessels, kidney, and also the fat cells. So the action is quite a lot. It is there on a lot of organs as well. So that is where we have to see how can it help the patient. And is it even able to help the patient also or not? So that is where 
comes a newer molecule, something which is called as liraglutide. Does anyone remember about this molecule? So this is one of the uh, GLP-1 analogs. The good thing is it not only decreases the glycosylated hemoglobin, but also can decrease the body weight. So yes, it does have a slight risk of hypoglycemia, but Yeah, 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 yeah. Now as well, is Your it? Your voice is keeping on breaking, doctor. Can you please go to the previous slide, doctor? Yeah, I'm... Okay, now? Yeah, now, yeah. Start from here, doctor. Okay, okay. So as I was telling you, so liraglutide is a very interesting molecule in the sense that not only it tends to decrease the gly glycosylated hemoglobin, but also reduces the weight of the patients so which is very important because you can control the diabetes and also its side effects as well but yes it may have a risk of hypoglycemia in fact so what about the other examples other than exenatide what are the other examples which are available so other examples as i had said it they can be glp1 analogs which includes exenatide liraglutide or LB glutide or dilaglutide as well. Otherwise, which can be given orally. Orally includes is DPP4 inhibitors. But yes, uh, like the other typical oral agents, they are slightly less potent, which includes the citagliptin, vildagliptin, saxagliptin, or so they are like the gliptins. So always try to remember it like this. The oral ones are gliptins. The parenteral, which are more potent ones, are the glutides or tides, in fact. So, if you are trying to achieve better glycemic control, so they have to be long-acting, long-acting GLP-1 uh, are agonists. So, what is going to happen is, the patient will be having the benefit of having higher insulin levels in the fasting stage, and also, of course, during the night time as well. But yes, there are some side effects as well, which is available. So the side effects for this includes is patient may develop nausea and vomiting. In fact, up to 5 to 10%. And also some of the patients may even have diarrhea. And there are some rare case reports also of the acute pancreatitis. So there is one uh, uh, specialized way of giving treatment is GLP-1 RA. And why is it important is because other than the weight loss and hypoglycemic risk, it also has a good control on the HbA1c. So HbA1c, I hope everyone already remembers. So HbA1c is glycosylated hemoglobin. And this takes care of the past three months of the diabetes control isn't it so it is still a early research molecule so that's why we will not be sharing too much so if we try to look on the molecular mechanism what happens is for example if you eat a meal whenever you eat a meal or any kind of food as well so there will be release of the intestinal glp1 release will be there which tends to make this enzyme active glp1 and this is the one which will be acting upon the dpp4 enzyme and the glp1 gets inactivated so the dpp4 inhibitor the molecule whichever those excites and all which you tend to give this is where it tends to act so this is important to for us to understand the mechanism if we can understand the mechanism we can use the molecule in a much better way okay so what are the various important things the various important things is if we want to get more benefits of the glp1 we have to prolong the half-life and simultaneously we have also to decrease the amount of inactivity of the patient so as i had already said to you glp1 function are plenty in the sense for example uh, if it is 
regarding the brain not only it causes neuroprotection but also decreases the appetite similarly for the heart it has cardio protection and also cardiac function gets improved similarly in the liver it tends to act and decreases the glucose production and for the adipose tissue it tends to increase the glucose uptake and also its storage as well and of course when it it has a very beneficial role by improving the insulin sensitivity so thus it increases the insulin secretion or decreases the glucagon secretion and also increases the insulin biosynthesis so it not only has a favorable effect on the insulin but also on all the different organs which is there around in fact there are some studies which has shown if it is added up for example glp1 inhibitor with insulin even if you are giving it with or without metformin you can decrease the fasting blood sugar by almost 15 mg per deciliter and the postprandial levels will be less by almost 36 uh, mg per deciliter in fact and gliptins is not only a hypoglycemic class which acts by inhibiting the dpp4 dpp4 if you all will remember the slide in which i had shown you so for example over here so dpp4 how does it act is by stopping or inhibiting the transformation of glp1 over here right to its inactive form so this is the reason so what will happen is a lot of times whenever you are using a drug you may be coming across the renal functions are compromised for the patient so for example if there is a patient with nephropathy it is better to use a dpp4 why because uh, if the gfr is much better you can just half the dose so it is not only good for example especially uh, if the, the patient is already uh, needing renal transplantation so some of the best drugs which is available for its usage is cetagliptin and linagliptin so we will try to give you a little bit overall action especially depending upon the glucose based so what tends to happen is over here when you eat a food of course the food is going to go to your gi tract right to the stomach and that is where the active glp1 is going to be released and that's when is going to stimulate the pancreas the beta cells so indirectly it does two role it has two roles is one is increasing the glucose uptake simultaneously also decreasing the hepatic glucose production right so as i had already said it there are various molecules in this uh, group which is dpp4 inhibitors so those examples are plenty however citagliptin was the one which was which was approved by us fda earliest almost more than 12 years back and after citagliptin was vildagliptin saxagliptin linagliptin and some of the recent the most recent drugs are Elogliptin and also gemigliptin as well. And uh, what was also uh, in the initial days, what had happened is the clinical observations, what was made with the DPP4 inhibitor was, especially for the pancreatitis or pancreatic cancer, was refused by the ADA. ADA, ADA stands for what? Does anyone remember what is ADA? What is ADA standing for? ADA is for American Diabetic Association. Exactly. So what happens is they said there is no proof for that. So there is no proof for any incidence of pancreatitis or even pancreatic cancer as well. And yes, uh, there was a, a warning was included which was said like it should not be used in a patient who is having pancreatitis.
So to give a little bit deeper clinical information about its usages, it's a once daily ingestion only. It not only reduces fasting and postprandial glucose, but also reduces the glycosylated hemoglobin and decreasing the glucagon response to the ingested meal. Similarly, the initial studies in combination with metformin has been really good. Good reports are there. And as we already said, it, these uh, group of drugs tend to prolong the action of incretin hormones. And they can always be used alone or also in combination with metformin, in fact. So linagliptin, for example, okay, now we will try to focus on these individual molecules. So for example, linagliptin can be used like 5 milligram per day. And it does not need any dose adjustment at all. So whatever may be the renal parameters and all, you need not adjust it at all. So a lot of times there can be some confusion between DPP-4 inhibitors and the GLP-1 agonist. So for example, if there is an elderly person, you will have to consider is DPP-4 inhibitor. Similarly, if there is a young diabetic with an abdominal obesity, yes, you should consider GLP-1 analog. Similarly, for a patient with moderate to severe renal failure as well, DPP-4 inhibitor should be considered, but in lesser dosage. Okay. So now coming to the Vildagliptin. So Vildagliptin, same way, nice thing is, it's only 50 mg twice daily. Almost 80% is eliminated unchanged by the kidney. And yes, there is slightly increased risk of in uh, skin lesion as well. So now the next gliptin is cetagliptin. Cetagliptin is you have to use 100 mg once daily and 80% gets eliminated unchanged by the kidney as well. And you can reduce the dosage to 25 to 50 mg per day in the patients with Narendra? Yeah. Dr. Narendra? Yeah. Doctor, your voice has gone breaking at the starting of the slide itself. Doctor, kindly can you repeat whatever you have said from for the slide? Okay. Uh, am I audible now? So, citagliptin, what yes, I said, doctor. everything is written on the slide. So, what I had said was, the interesting thing is, you have to give normally 100 milligram once daily. If someone is having a renal failure, you have to reduce the dosage to 25 to 50 milligram. But yes, the patient who is taking this medicine may have an increased risk of pancreatitis. Okay. So now tenagliptin is another example for which you need really less dosage in the terms of like 20 milligram per day. And this also improves the early phase insulin secretion. And you need not adjust the dosage at all for the patients. So now coming to the saxagliptin. Saxagliptin, you can combine it with the thiazolidineons or also with the metformin. So the interesting or nice thing about saxagliptin is dosage is even less, like 2.5 to only 5 milligram once daily. And yes, it is one of the most quoted DPP-4 inhibitor. And yes, it tends to increase also the risk of heart failure. So you have to be slightly careful whenever you are using for a patient with a heart failure. So, to summarize, the, just a second. Yes, we still have several slides as well to go. So to summarize the DPP-4 inhibition, so what happens is, I hope you all can already understand, it decreases the GLP-1 levels. So that's why it will be causing lesser value of the sugar levels, not only in fasting, but also the postprandial. 
it has an improved action also on the pancreatic beta cells as well so in terms of increasing the insulin secretion decreasing the uh, resistance chances inhibits the glucagon secretion and also increasing the insulin sensitivity and similarly it also tends to reduce the postprandial lipemia and yes it also can reduce the glycosylated hemoglobin percentage by almost one percentage so the benefits are quite a lot and what has happened is yes uh, when the dpp4 inhibitors were being used there were some patients who were developing upper respiratory tract infection although when there was a meta analysis of several papers was done it was shown that this drug may reduce the risk of bone fractures so okay let, we will try to give you some of the practical settings what or how can you do for example if uh, yeah if the patient is admitted in a ward okay and uh, what is being tried is you are already trying only the diet or maybe some oral agents or a very low dosage of insulin but you are not able to control that medicine so what you can do is you can try to combine them with dpp4 inhibitors and of course the corrective dosage of insulin or whatever a diet control which you are giving otherwise you can also same way combine with the usage of dpp4 inhibitors and also give basal insulin in terms of 0 0.15 to 0 0.5 0 0.25 units per kg okay now coming to the icu setting so as i already said it if it is patient is in wards you manage it differently but similarly if the patient is in icu then what you do is you have to give iv infusion of glp1 okay plus of course the corrective dosage and what happens is you have to lower the insulin dose adjustments so as to improve the left ventricular fa function especially if, the, if the, you have to come across a patient who has had a myocardial infarction or congestive heart failure as well, you can do it like this. Otherwise, you can give subcutaneous exenatide and you can give in terms of 5 to 10 microgram BD. Okay, otherwise, if there is a pediatric burn patient, okay, you can give IV insulin as well. So, what, see, we try to remember most of the things, but medicine is all about logic. Logic, why? Because if any medicine is being used, there has to be a logic behind it. If you can understand that logic, it becomes very easy for you. So, the GLP-1 inhibitor, which I had already shown you in some of the previous figures as well. So, what happens is, GLP-1 has a, a big effect on a lot of other organs other organs I had already said it on the stomach liver alpha cells and also the beta cells as well in the human body and what happens is GLP receptor agonists it can be of different types different types in the sense like some can lower the overall blood glucose level otherwise some will be acting more on the postprandial similarly some can be short acting similarly some can be long acting as well short acting ones are like exenatide or lixizenatide or the long acting ones are like the liraglutide dulaglutide or albiglutide then coming to the short acting glp1 re uh, receptors uh, agonists so as i had already said it to you liraglutide is the one and exenatide is the one so liraglutide, as I already said, it, the best advantage is you need to give only subcutaneous, only once. The other good thing is that, yeah, the elimination is, uh, time is like uh, 12 to 24 hours. So once if you have given, that is enough. But exenatide, you will have to give subcutaneous and twice daily. And the, due to its rapid absorption, the, it peaks in almost nearly two year, two hours actually.
So if you will see this chart, this is a very nice and well summarized chart. I have given especially for a lot of people who may be getting confused. Getting confused, for example, for how to differentiate between the short acting GLP-1 receptor agonists and the long acting GLP receptor agonists. So exenatide and lixenatide are the short acting and the other ones like liraglutide, dulaglutide or exenatide, they are the long acting ones. So that's what you can see it, it's pretty different, right? So there has been some recent guidelines as well which has been trying to confirm especially about the safety of the entreating agents because of the various confusion uh, between the mechanism of action so what has been happening uh, is like even the uh, American College of Endocrinology they said it in their 2013 consensus document that look nothing has been established yet so it's difficult to say so none of these uh, statements tend to confirm that yes there is such a big side effect and all as well and yes whenever you are using such kind of medications some patient can have headache GI disorder or even injection site reaction so to summarizing you know on an overall basis DPP4 inhibitors they not only have a single organ effect but also on multiple organs and most of these effects are beneficial for the patient and it will give on an overall basis beneficial picture beneficial picture for the overall glycemic control so that is why these drugs may be something new but effects are uh, the positive effects are quite a lot and this is the reason why a lot of a lot of physicians are using this medicine at all as well so are there any questions so far